I'm Femi OK. I'm Malika Bilal and you're in the stream. Today, was Indian independence icon Mahatma Gandhi racist? We explore his legacy as, a state, as the statue of him is torn down in Ghana. The story was pitched to us on Twitter by community member DJ Sila. But you too can be part of this conversation. Tweet us your thoughts or leave them in our live YouTube chat. Hi, my name is Obianu Jue Culture. I am Nigerian. I run a, a Culture of Life Africa, which is a pro-life organization, and you are in the stream. Mahatma Gandhi is famous worldwide for his non-violent resistance to British colonial rule. But last week, University of Ghana officials removed his statue from the campus, citing complaints from faculty and students that he was racist towards black Africans. Donated to the university in 2016 by the Indian government, the statue drew criticism almost immediately, with critics using the hashtag Gandhi must fall to draw attention to derogatory statements the young Gandhi made while living in South Africa. Here with us to discuss this in Accra, Obadele Campbell is a research coordinator of language, literature and drama at the University of Ghana. He's also one of the organizers of the Gandhi must fall campaign. In New Delhi, India, Rama Lakshmi is the opinion editor at The Print. And in New York, New York, Zachariah Mampili is a professor of political science and Africana studies at Vassar College. Hello, everybody. It's really good to have you in the stream. I want to start with a petitioner speaking to us from Ghana. She's also uh, a professor of African and Gender Studies at the University of Ghana, and she signed this petition to bring down that statue. Here is a short list of reasons why she thinks this is important. Akosua writes, the question to ask is, should an African university honor a non-African who had no direct relationship to Ghana with a statue when it has not honored any Ghanaian or African who served our interests or fought directly for us? Should an African university honor a man who devalued the freedom of Africans in South Africa? And should African universities receive such gifts uncritically and without consulting constituents. So loads to think about right at the top there, Obadele. Talk to us about how this statue got to the University of Ghana. Very good. We actually have a timeline in a forthcoming article with Roads Must Fall. And it came as part of uh, the president of India, uh, Pranav Mukherjee, uh, coming and giving a speech. And it's actually come to light that actually India is going all around the world putting statues of Gandhi around. And the way that I came into uh, the discussion is that, you know, again, people weren't consulted. People here, staff, students were not consulted. It just came, and I guess it was the idea of who could possibly have an issue with Gandhi. So as I was driving, I just looked and I said, oh, look, here's a statue of Gandhi. So I actually went, took a photo, and then sent that out with about 50 or more of Gandhi's most racist quotes. From there, you know, the vice chancellor of the university, who's actually the one who uh, approved it, he said, oh, I think he changed later on in life. So then I sent other quotes from uh, luminaries like Baba Sahib, Sahib uh, Ambedkar about Gandhi's oppression of the Dalits, which are the black untouchables of India later on in life. And, you know, essentially what we're dealing with is, to some degree, cognitive dissonance. So people are having, you know, their assumptions based on the Gandhi movie, which was financed by India in large part. Uh, they're having those assumptions questioned, and now they're trying to, you know, save this uh, hero or icon that's been foisted upon them uh, due to what we term improper Gandhi, which is improper propaganda about Gandhi. And, you know, Gandhi was in no small part a uh, progenitor of that through his autobiography. So people who come to the autobiography first then they tend to be the ones who are like, Gandhi is great. Those who come to the collected works of uh, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, those are the ones who tend to have, you know, a much more accurate and factual opinion of okay. Gandhi based on his actual writings. Uh -huh. Zachary, when you look, uh, I'm, I'm just going to show you the petition here. So the petition that was uh, launched from the University of Ghana, that Obadali was part of, uh, Gandhi's statue at the University of Ghana must come down. You see that statue of Gandhi, and there's so many around the world. When you look at him, represented like this, what do you see? I think Abadele is correct to point out that the politics of why the statues were put up in the first place is complicated. And we should point out that the Indian government currently uh, is a far-right, radical Hindu nationalist government, uh, in fact, a party that has close links 
to the man who killed Gandhi. So it is unfortunate to see how he's been appropriated uh, in such a narrow Hindu nationalist frame. Uh, and if that was the basis for which people were challenging his legacy, I, I would have no objection. But I think that you know the uh, ways in which the critique of Gandhi in Ghana and elsewhere in Africa has been put forth is largely based on a, a fabrication uh, that emphasizes his politics early in his career uh, when he was very much a racist in line with British colonial values of the time and ignores his much longer history of engaging with black uh, political figures mm. as well as uh, thinkers uh, that fundamentally transformed the way we should think about his racial politics. Zachariah, you know people are going to be listening to this and watching this and thinking, what do you mean Gandhi was racist? Explain. Well, you know, in, Gandhi was a British-trained lawyer who f first went to the UK at the age of 19. Uh, he was from an upper caste family. They were administrators in the colonial government. Uh, and he very much embodied and, and believed strongly in the ideals of Western <laughs> civilization at the time, which were premised on various forms of white supremacy. Uh, and it's not surprising that as a, as a lawyer in South Africa, he espoused many views which we should all reject today and which were clearly offensive. Uh, but we don't remember Gandhi for his colonial ideals. Uh, what we remember him for is how he transformed into an anti-colonial figure. And that doesn't really happen until around 1919, uh, when he leaves South Africa and then goes to India. And after a few years in India, having observed the brutality of the Amritsar massacre, denounces Western civilization and Western colonialism uniformly. Uh, and that's the point where I think his views on race transform substantially. Mm. Zachariah, here is one person online who did know that history. Uh, this is Miss B. Mack, Miss Scholarly Info on Twitter. She writes in, I know the history and I'm proud of my alma mater that they got to action, speaking of the University of Ghana. She goes on to say, I first learned about Gandhi's speeches where he publicly described Africans as quote unquote, savages in undergrad. I took South Asian literature as well as black world studies coursework. We were reading primary documents, so it wasn't just hearsay. So Rama, I'm wondering what you thought when you saw this news, keeping in mind you wrote this piece uh, posted on the Washington Post back in 2015. You see the headline here, what did Mahatma Gandhi think of black people? Rama, what were your thoughts when you see, saw the statue come down? I wasn't surprised at all. I had been following uh, the news for some years. Um, I had been following a lot of email exchanges. Um, and uh, the publisher of this book that I wrote about in 2015 uh, was keeping me uh, posted about what's going on in the campaign. Um, so on social media, I would constantly read about these opposition. So I wasn't surprised. Um, what is really unfortunate or uh, what's really ironical is that this is all coming out at a time when Indian government is getting ready to um, <laughs> commemorate the 150th birth anniversary yes. of Gandhi. And this is uh, what Zakaria talked about is the Hindu go nationalist government here. And um, they have set aside over... We'll we come back to uh, Rama. We've lost the connection. It's just frozen just for a moment. Okay. Uh, Obadali, I, I, I heard you sort of smiling in a, in a, uh, a slightly ironical way there as Rama was talking about this anniversary of Gandhi coming up. Uh, why did you do so? Right. Yeah, you know, it's actually interesting. So what uh, uh, Professor Manfili brought up just in terms of what we term mode diplomacy, we've actually written an article that connects this to the global geopolitics where uh, Narendra Modi was known for his participation and actually, um, you know, this 2002 Gujarat riot, which is also described as a pogrom in which uh, many of the Muslims were, you know, killed off, uh, estimates up to a thousand of them. And what we see is, you know, Modi and also uh, Rama wrote an article about how India itself is the number one importer of arms and weapons. Uh, in the world, uh, and that was in 2014. Another updated article came out in 2018. But what I think, um, you know, and this is the point that wasn't touched on by Professor Mampili, was that what Modi is doing is he's really following in the footsteps of Gandhi in the sense of, you know, using Gandhi as the face of peace and things of that nature, but actually, you know, fomenting war. You know, India has nuclear weapons, weapons of mass destruction, so forth and so on but they're giving this soft power face to the world. Now, we, if you look at Gandhi, 
you know, he supposedly took this Brahmacharya vow in 1906, but then in 1907, he's saying, let's go back to the war front. He said that his whole rationale was so that they could get military uh, training, so that they can use rifles. Now, let's look at his later life, because this is one thing that isn't done often enough, is that people look at, you know, his time in South Africa uh, being anti-black, but then they don't look so much at his time in India being anti-black. And I want to quote uh, Baba Saheb Ambedkar, where he said, Everybody felt that Mr. Gandhi was the most determined enemy of the untouchables. The main purpose for which Mr. Gandhi came to the roundtable conference was to oppose the demands of the untouchables. He actually coerced them through a fast unto the death to uh, sign this Pune Pact, where they had to give up their separate electorates. They had to uh, give up the double vote and other things. And he said, you should be trustees so I'd like uh, to, to the Hindu. I'd like to address what he's saying, which is, yes, Gandhi has always been a complex figure. And he's a father of nation. He's Every Indian is taught to worship Gandhi right from school, from uh, every textbook. But uh, there's always been questioning of Gandhi. Um, he's right about Baba Sahib Ambedkar. There has, it, Baba Sahib Ambedkar, who is a um, Dalit scholar and lawyer and the person who uh, drafted the uh, constitution, uh, chaired the panel that drafted the constitution, he mounted the most formidable challenge to uh, ideological challenge to uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi when Gandhi was alive on the caste issue, that Gandhi didn't go far right. enough. And even when Gandhi was alive, there were many freedom fighters who said his pacifist route was too slow. So there was constant, and, and uh, it's ironic because the person who shot him is the man who thought Gandhi was pro-Muslims. Right, and then you see, and then you see that in in South Africa, Gandhi used the word kafir, um, uh, which is derogatory, uh, uh, which is a derogatory term uh, for Muslims. So uh, that Muslims use. So um, so Gandhi was a bundle of contradictions, right? Like any any complex human being. The problem is when you uh, declare somebody a mahatma or a great soul, and then you decide to worship that person for the rest of your life for posterity. That's where the problem comes. I think in the 150th year, as I wrote, the best way uh, to uh, commemorate the 150 years is not to garland his statues or worship him, but to critically engage with the man. Yes, mm -hmm. there were problems. Yes, um, he was the biggest advocate of nonviolence and civil disobedience, which is the greatest legacy for all social movements, even today in India, all environmental movements, all uh, even today in India. But having said that, his uh, observations on race, on caste, hugely problematic but um he's after all and, a human being can, even today even today right his quick. grandson his uh, gandhi's grandson wrote an op-ed today in the newspaper in india mm -hmm. addressing this issue he's speaking to this issue in ghana and he said uh, he quoted mandela saying um Let's not apply the 21st century lens to study Gandhi. He says Gandhi must be judged mm. in the context of his time and circumstances. And he also said Gandhi never wanted statues, um, and he never so, asked so for Rama, statues. It, just like so, Ghana, so, so Rama and Abadele, just I'm take a pause for a moment because okay. hold tight for me, Abadele, just for a moment because I want to bring okay. in another voice here. We actually spoke to Mahatma Gandhi's granddaughter, Ila Gandhi, uh, and we asked her about what do you make of this Gandhi. He must for campaign uh, and the uh, reviewing of your grandfather's legacy. And this is what she told us. Uh, certainly, Gandhiji did not hold the kind of views that uh, are purported, um, you know, that he, he held uh, by some people, by a few activists uh, who are saying that today. I think that they need to read the other books. They have only read one book, which uh, gives um, the negative side of Gandhiji. There were many things on which he changed his views in later life. And so I think that it's uh, what he left behind. The, the legacy that he left behind is what we have to look at. She talks about the legacy he left behind. So I want to bring in a few comments 
on that specifically. This from Osman on YouTube, who says, Gandhi is associated with peace and truth throughout the world. He even inspired a lot of African leaders, such as Nelson Mandela. However, he was an imperfect human being. And over on Twitter, Peter here says, he made it clear, speaking of Gandhi, that he fought for Indian liberation only, and he never saw Indians as equal to Africans. So, Zakaria, talk to us about a complicated legacy and how you pick apart such a complicated legacy. Yeah, I think I mentioned two things. I mean, first, you know, I, I'm, un, I'm, I'm unhappy with the way in which the Gandhi Must Fall movement has moved forward, mainly because I think that it is not trying to deal with this in a, in a way that I consider to be consistent with a pan-African or black radical politics. Uh, you know, Gandhi, uh, Gandhi's legacy in Africa, is, as has already been mentioned, is complicated. Uh, but, you know, you cannot deny that he spent decades of his life engaging with a variety of different black political figures uh, in very substantive and meaningful ways uh, that would suggest that, you know, we have to think that they were naive or they didn't understand the racial politics of the time or that they were openly engaging with the racist. Uh, and I find that hard to believe. I mean, W.E. Du Bois, who himself died a Ghanaian citizen, uh, was a close follower of Gandhi. They had mutual exchanges that were very, uh, I think, intellectually productive for both of them. And how do we reconcile those kind of substantive engagements with black struggles globally uh, with the caricature that is being put forth today? And then the second thing I wanted to say, I think, unfortunately, unlike something like Fees Must Fall or Roads Must Fall, which were truly anti-colonial struggles and which have been linked to a variety of other issues uh, in South Africa, like free education or the lack of basic services, uh, what I see with Gandhi Must Fall, and I'm happy to be educated otherwise, is a very sort of nationalist reaction to any sort of internationalist politics. Uh, and I find that to be disappointing in, in terms of what is actually needed right now in the face of these kind of right-wing nationalist politics that we see globally uh, from Brazil to the United States and I think increasingly in parts of Africa as well, and certainly in India too. Obadele? Yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, touch one on the uh, Kafir issue because that came up that I want to actually quote Gandhi, 1907, where he said and before, that I, he, before you do that, let yeah. me just, Albert Daly, do you want to explain the weight uh, of the word, of the K-word, yes. for certain yes, people, so, well, just for South Africans, the weight of that word, because you have to explain that before you quote good. something. Go ahead. Very good. So uh, Gandhi himself, he talked about the Chandal, and he said that if the term Kafir is a term of opprobrium, then how much more the term uh, Chandal, you know, being used for the Dalits. So this means that Gandhi himself understood the term Kafir as a word. It's like the N-word in the U.S. It's a term that has been actionable by law since the 1970s, where if you use it, you can be charged uh, of a hate crime. Now, this is a double standard that we see with uh, Gandhi. So in 1907, he takes, uh, you know, reservation about being called a coolie, he says one hears the term coolie lawyer, coolie doctor, coolie merchant, coolie marries. He, and he says he is even denied talking about the Indian, the not always obvious privilege of riding in the same municipal tram cars with his white fellow colonists. Fellow colonists. He says if children are afforded no fac uh, facilities for education except they attend the school set apart for Kaffirs. So in the exact same quote that he is, you know, taking this stand against being called a coolie, which is, you know, we could say an equivalent term against the Indians, he is still using the term Kafir, even though he himself acknowledges that this is a term that's being used, you know, against black people. Now, again, if we look at his early life and his later life, what you see is consistency. But what people don't understand is that Gandhi, first, a, a lot of the leaders who were duped by Gandhi, they didn't have access to his writings in Hindi and Gujarati, for example because the collected works of uh, Gandhi weren't what do you available mean, into the What do you mean 1990s. by duped? What do you mean by duped? Yeah, by duped, I mean that they read, for example, his autobiography, where he said that his heart was with the Zulus, that he bore no, no grudge against the Zulus, and he was happy to hear that he would be part of the ambulance corps that would be nursing Zulu, Zulus, and his work consisted of uh, nursing only wounded Zulus. Now, that's, that's uh, Gandhi, the, what I could say, pathological liar, because when you read his writings at that time, he's saying we need rifles, 
We need to be trained for warfare. Our whole, mm. uh, our whole thrust in being part of the ambulance corps is so that we can later on get military training, so that we can get so, you know uh, warfare. We can get rifles. Oh, but so Dana, just, just take a pause for a moment lying, because we want to bring you know, in some some other comments no on what you're saying and and the discussion that we've been having so far. No so pathological liar, strong words there. Exactly. I want to bring in someone who might disagree with you. This is Maddie on Twitter. She says, all of those racist comments, like the ones you just read, were from before his quote-unquote awakening. For me, it won't yeah, change after. his hero status achieved by fighting colonialism later on. Oh, but Dele, I hear you, but I, I just want to continue to, no to problem, give no share problem. Maddie's viewpoint. She says, we have a hospital named after him in Ethiopia, and I don't wish for that to change. Now, someone who would agree with you, Obedele, is another organizer who I read at the top of the show. Uh, Professor uh, Okusua says, this is true, but the University of Ghana erected Gandhi after those so-called complicated pasts had been extensively written about and at a time when no African hero graced our campus. So she already pushed back on Maddie's comment there. But I want to bring so, in one well, more voice. Correct. I want to bring in Let's one more voice. Incorrect. Because so she said that that was before his change. And, it's and some of them were change. after. So I hear you, like, no, especially because they were written them, in a different language than many of these citing, historians of were the unearthing. Ones that I'm after this I hear you, Obedele. I hear you. And I think Maddie yeah. might hear you as well. She's watching the show. But I want to bring in one more perspective who merges those two comments I just read. This is someone who sent us a video comment, Priya. She's a professor at the uh, Boston College in Massachusetts. And here's how she sums it up. Most people are complicated. They hold contradictory beliefs and act inconsistently over their lifetimes. And I think Gandhi was no exception. He had troubling views on certain issues, but also played a critical role in inspiring anti-colonialism and social justice movements in Asia, Africa, and around the world. The Gandhi Must Fall movement makes me wonder uh, personally why we have found the need to build so many statues to try to make absolute heroes out of imperfect leaders in the first place, when perhaps there are better ways for us to commemorate the everyday popular struggles that ultimately brought an end to colonialism. Zachary, I'll give that one to you. Better ways to commemorate some of these leaders and figures. Absolutely. I think that, you know, we can pick apart the legacy of any number of anti-colonial figures uh, by digging into their past. And, and it's certainly appropriate for us to do that. Uh, but I think what gets missed in all of these stories, and I think here is where I agree uh, to some degree with uh, Professor Obedele, is, you know, why are we venerating figures from the past in the first place? And I think there is a politics to it, and that should be interrogated. And I think that where uh, Gandhi must fall is challenging the Indian nationalist politics of the current government. I fully support their agenda. I think what I find disappointing is the ways in which uh, we are questioning, you know, his legacy, not by providing a fuller and com more, more complicated picture of who Gandhi was and who any of our heroes was, or even asking the question of why we need to erect statues to these figures instead of celebrating everyday ordinary people uh, who struggle to live lives of basic dignity. Um, but instead, we are getting caught up in these sort of nationalist and reactionary politics uh, that are unfortunately unfolding in many different places around the world. Uh, so I don't think simply erecting more African leaders to replace the Gandhi statue is any much any any sort of improvement, and they would be susceptible to the same kind of critiques that we are seeing leveled against Gandhi as well. Rama, may I just show you a couple of uh, pictures here? This is from the Hindustan Times. Mahatma Gandhi statue vandalized in South Africa. And then this one here with Obadele triumphantly standing on the plinth that once held Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, so happy that he has gone as a statue. How are some Indians processing what is now happening around the world to somebody as, as uh, well thought of as Mahatma Gandhi? Um. Again, uh, there are many people who are um, defending Gandhi, and their defense rests on two things. One is that the man evolved, right? And they quote uh, later quotes. Of course, in 47, he may have said something, and then in 42, he said something else. Mm -hmm. So there are as many quotes that you can bring up to uh, uh, to buttress your argument. So there sure. are people who say he changed, he evolved. Yes. And then there are those who say we should not use uh, today's lens to study uh, Gandhi. He was a product of his time. These are the I two con um, uh, okay. two defense. So Rabbi, so are I, we, we're at people. the end of the show, well, but I, I hear the, the debate that is also going on, not just outside of India, but inside India. Thank you, guests.
for this conversation, Malika. Both sites here on Twitter and on YouTube. 2JT says, I agree with the removal of the statue. Racists are not supposed to be honored. On the other side, HG Flores says, I support the university's right to remove the statue. However, I don't agree with the reason. And you can follow this discussion and keep it going online by following us on Twitter. And we're at AJ Stream. Malika and I will see you next time. Take care.